Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Austin Belzer from Austin Media, but if you're watching this, you probably already know that. Um, today I have the uh, director of the short film, The Hairdresser, um, who she's a part of the AFI Docs 2021 Shorts Program number two, which is screening right now. I think you can see it. I don't know the price, but you can buy a pass and just watch that. I think maybe for free, I'm not quite sure. Um, that's how they did at AFI Fest. But everyone, uh, welcome Lorraine Price. Hi. <laughs> okay, so um, just quick, um, I really enjoyed the film. I watched it last night. It was one of the uh, uh, films I watched um, as part of homework, I guess you could call it. Um, and yeah, I just really enjoyed it. It's very, um, it, it, it's a different kind of short because a lot of shorts are just focused on a hundred different things sometimes, but this mm. was actually really, really focused. Um, so, um, and there, there's a lot said about um, dignity and the power of looking good in this film, or in the short film, rather. Um, I guess what um, do you think the power of looking good while sick is for a patient? Oh, sure, yeah. Well, I mean, Kathleen does uh, the hair and she does do the makeup also um, of patients in palliative care, although in the film, it, um, she's just uh, doing a patient's hair. And I think um, for me, it's really just about dignity uh, at the end of life. So it's less about this transformation from, you know, someone who wasn't wearing makeup and didn't have their hairstyle to someone who suddenly looks beautiful um, in their hospital bed. It's less about that and just a little bit more about the human interaction and, um, you know, and Kathleen providing this service that isn't um, provided by the hospital and, you know, not because they're neglectful, but because uh, hair washing doesn't necessarily fall within the purview of, you know, a doctor's job or a nurse's job. They're, you know, they're concerned with other things. They need to make sure people are eating and that they are medicated and, you know, so um, it's, it's quite possible that patients in palliative care who do end up staying there for several weeks, you know, can go all of that time without having their hair washed just because it's not um, in anyone's job description. So if someone like Kathleen isn't there to do it for them, then it doesn't happen. And we all know how it feels to, lie, to not have our hair washed for several days or, you know, so for weeks, it's, um, it's really unpleasant. Um, so yeah, so for me, it's less about this transformation or like this beautification of a person and uh, just more about dignity at the end of life. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I, I worked in medical billing and I don't think there was uh, any CPT code for uh, hair washing. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Kathleen, I, how, how did you find her? Um, well, so uh, the film is dedicated to my grandmother, um, and uh, my grandmother was always this very loud dresser. She had, uh, so there's a picture of her at the very end of the film, mm -hmm. um, and she always had shoulder length, bright red fire engine hair. She dyed it that way. Uh, she always wore bright red lipstick. She did her nails. They were long and like ornately decorated. She wore costume jewelry. She was just very loud. Um, and when she passed away uh, in hospice care, her hair was short and white and, you know, no, no makeup whatsoever. And her nails were, weren't done either. And she just looked like remarkably unlike herself. Um, and she was also suffering from dementia towards the end. So we lost her, I think, before she left us in more ways than one, really. Sure. Um, and, uh, so my grandmother passed away and then I came back to Montreal and I read a, uh, an article in a local newspaper here called La Presse. It was a very tiny article about Kathleen and her work. And, um, and it just sort of transformed my understanding of end of life care because with my grandmother, we were very much caught up, or at least I was very much caught up in making sure that she wasn't suffering and, you know, just trying to handle my grief that I didn't think to do these kinds of things for her. Um, and so when I read that article, uh, it just kind of hit me 
and uh, and I reached out to the journalist who then put me in touch with Kathleen and I and then we started to make this film together. Yeah, I might I might have to check that article out because it's just when you watch the short, you just are thinking. At least I was thinking the whole time. How does somebody get into this kind of thing? Because mm -hmm. going into it, you you're thinking, oh, okay, hairdresser. I know what that is, and then you don't. You just don't yeah. know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, because I think even in the U.S., uh, I don't think we have. People, maybe we do, but they might just blow, fly under the radar. Um, people who are essentially beauticians, mm -hmm. uh, patients. I don't think. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, it's really not uh, like ubiquitous in terms of a service that people yeah. provide. Um, it takes someone special, like <laughs> like Kathleen you know, who um, takes what is typically considered a pedestrian profession, right? Yeah. Um, hairdressing, and then does this really beautiful um, and meaningful thing with it, which is why I called it the hairdresser. I kind of wanted to play a little bit on um, what the audience is going to bring to the film, you know, thinking like, oh yeah, hairdressing, like exactly, I know what that's about. And then- yeah. And then you're surprised to learn what she actually does with her craft. Yeah, and you know, in that sense, um, I guess that kind of answers one of my questions I had uh, right. <laughs> about what drove you to it. Um, but yeah, I just think it's such a turn there mm. is really, um, really nice. Um, so I guess a lot of shorts go, I, I think, at least uh, based off what I've seen out of Tribeca and Sundance and AFI Fest even, um, a lot of shorts go for a powerful soundtrack that's supposed to evoke a certain feeling. But in this short, there's none of that as far as I uh, remember last mm -hmm. night. So was that just kind of, you say dignity a lot about the short. Um, is that another form of dignity? Hmm. Interesting. Well, I think uh, there's a couple reasons for that. One, I always wanted to make a film with no music, just to see if I could do that. Uh, because I think, you know, sometimes as filmmakers, we use music uh, as a little bit of a crutch to um, to make our audience feel something or to signal to them what they're supposed to be feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I really didn't want to do that with this film and I was just interested in experimenting with um, how to do it in general. But with this film, I felt like uh, the emotional, like the content of the film and the subject matter was so powerful that it just didn't need anything to underscore it. Um, and that it was more powerful if we were just in that room with them listening to the sounds of the room. Yeah. And then yeah, the, only, the only music cue is at the very, very end over the credits because that's when silence wasn't working anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't really just jump cut to credits when it's already kind of a jump in, in itself. Um, yeah. So you go from having all this bit, uh, this imagery of, uh, and in, in fact, in a sense, you kind of set up the credits with the pan out from the uh, hospital room, mm -hmm. um, which I just now thought about. Um, but so I guess furthering on that sense of dignity, because I find this so interesting, um, mm -hmm. because this is, again, this is not a boisterous short to anyone who's watching this later um, or listening. Um, th this is, is very understated. So, and that kind of translates to the cinematography. I heard you talk last night to AFI Doc, the programmer there, um, talk about how you just didn't want to not invalid, not invalidate, but um, basically not show too much. Mm. And it brings me to a thing um, Kathleen says in the film where she's talking about a mirror. The patient doesn't want to see themselves. Mm. Um, and I guess how, how much of that did you just kind of learn along the way of, hey, don't, there, there's not a lot of shots of the face here. And mm -hmm. 
was that another form of dignity? Uh, yeah, I think so in a way. Um, so I guess there's a sort of two part answer to that question. Um, so this film took overall four years to make yeah. <laughs> from the beginning to the end, um, even though I only ever did three shoots. Um, so uh, I started it about four years ago and I, um, I had access and then the hospital administration changed and I lost access uh, and then I had to get it again. And then once I had my access again, the palliative care unit moved within the hospital. And so there were just like several years in which I couldn't shoot. And also Kathleen um, is a snowbird. And so she leaves for Florida every winter. And so there was a good chunk of every year that I couldn't shoot with her. Um, and, but over the course of those four years, I would just take my, uh, I'd take a lab and a Zoom recorder and I would just go over to Kathleen's house and sit on her couch and we'd talk. And she would tell me stories. Um, and uh, so I have a lot of tape. I have way more tape than I have um, footage. And, um, and so that story, that particular story about the mirror comes from one of those um, like little couch talks that we had. Um, okay. But in terms of the shooting style and staying uh, a little and staying away from um, really resting on a face too long and in particular the patient's face, I really have to credit um, my cinematographer with that, with uh, Jackie, Jackie, Jacqueline Mills. Um, so we were a very, very tiny crew. Um, it was just me and Jackie in the room. And because of the environment, it's not as though we didn't do any development shoots. So we didn't go in and see what it was going to feel like to have a camera in the room um, before we were in production. Um, so Jackie and I were both concerned that it was going to feel exploitative or uncomfortable to have a camera in that space yeah. for the audience. And we didn't want to feel, we just, you know, obviously we didn't want the film to feel that way. We wanted it to feel empathetic and compassionate and, um, and, and genuine. So, um, you know, we walked into that room with Madame Lalonde and it was the first shoot that we ever did. And I was on sound, so I needed Jackie to be very, very independent with the camera. And she's a director herself, which is what I needed. I needed a DP who could also think like a director. Yeah. And, um, and at one point while we were shooting, she just kind of whispered to me, you know, she said, I, I can't, I have to cut up the images. I can't just rest on her face all the time because it doesn't feel right. Uh, and, and I said, go for it. You know, I trust you. And she just sort of started floating around the interaction and her, that's why I love to work with Jackie anyway. She's just so emotionally intelligent and she has such a light touch on the camera. Um, so she just sort of started floating and cutting up the images in interesting ways and concentrating on hands and like skin details and, and instead of, you know, these shots of like these portrait shots. And I think that um, so in that sense, yes, I think it does relate directly to dignity um, and not, not, and creating images that just didn't feel exploitative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, it um, I think the most we even ever get is the establishing shot and the end shot. Mm. And that was kind of, I, I think it, it was interesting to, at least to me, because when you go and see a movie, like just I'll throw out one I just reviewed, um, Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, that, that you have to focus on the face. There's that framing thing. And this is just like, no, we know you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. it, it trusted the viewer. Um, but, and I guess this is always one of my favorite questions to ask. Um, what surprised you while making this short? Oh, um, I mean, I think, honestly, I was surprised that we got in the room. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we, you know, I arranged access with the hospital and with the Palliative Care Foundation that runs this unit in the hospital. And obviously Kathleen was on board with the project. and. So everything was in place for us to have access, but we showed up for these shoots and we weren't even um, permitted to go into the room to present the idea of the documentary to somebody until they agreed to participate. So 
that's why um, you see we're shooting from the doorway when Kathleen goes into Madame Lalonde's room and introduces herself and the services that she provides. And what isn't in the film is that after that, she said, oh, by the way, and also I'm being followed <laughs> by a yeah. documentary crew and they're making this film and would you, you know, be interested in participating? So, um, so that, that was tricky. And I just wasn't sure, honestly, you know, if anyone was going to feel like opening up that space to us when they're so vulnerable. Um, and I, and I, it was the most pleasant surprise to me that Malone, Madame Lalon did it. And then she actually ended up um, doing it twice. She was, she was the patient who participated in two shoots and um, there were patients who said no. So. Yeah, I'd imagine. Um, yeah. And you know, that does bring up interesting, and this is just my health insurance background kind of firing up. Um, I don't know if it's the same in France, um, Quebec as it is here, mm -hmm. um, but there would be all these kind of interesting um, HIPAA. I don't know if you have HIPAA over there, um, but it's basically, if, if you don't know what it is, it's basically how much um, can be disclosed to outsiders. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, it, 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 I think that kind of just brings up an interesting question of, yeah, how does that will even work? Because like, are, are, is that a now medical documentary now that it, um, in a sense, because now we're talking about palliative care, excuse me, it's early in the morning, <laughs> but, um, but I guess, uh, one of the questions I had is, why palliative care? Oh, um, well, I mean, I, th I think we, we really don't think about these services being offered to people at the end of life. Yeah. Um, you know, people who are ill, perhaps it's a little bit more common. Uh, I don't know though, because I haven't looked into it, like uh, people who aren't suffering from a terminal illness. Also, you know, um, people who are ill and in hospital, they have a hospital room, they have a bathroom yeah. and if they're able to go and shower and wash their own hair, then they will do that. Um, but someone like Madame Lalonde, who also we see in the film, she's not feeding herself anymore. She yeah. doesn't have the use of her hands. So she can't do very, very simple things for herself. So she couldn't wash her hair if she wanted to. Um, so I, I just, I think, um, one is, I mean, that's just where Kathleen worked, but also for me, it just, uh, it was something that I think m the majority of people don't consider. Yeah. As a, as a, you know, something to do for people when they're, when they're dying. Like, yeah. Yeah. And for sure, I think, and I think this is one of the more, um, I guess, I don't want to say accurate depictions, but um, yes, <laughs> um, because I think anytime you see anything like this in um, a film or a short mm -hmm. is when they're already at the morgue. Mm -hmm. And it's a, kind of a negative spin, but you take a positive spin, which is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, that's found that kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But um, anyways, yeah. Um, so have you have you seen anything at AFI Doc 2021? Oh, it's geo-blocked to the States oh. and I'm in Canada, so I can't watch anything. It's really painful. You know, it's VPN, just well, I know. I know. But well, you didn't hear that from me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, we'll see. <laughs> but not yet. We'll just say not yet. I haven't seen anything. But but yeah. But I would um, really like to. Oh no, that's not true. Wait, I did see my shorts block because okay. we did a QA and so we circulated our films. Um and uh there are some great films in my shorts block. Like when we were bullies is so it's so good. <laughs> it's so smart. The animation is so good. The game is so yeah, there's everything in my shorts block is is great. Block number two, people. Block number two. Yeah, shorts program number two. Um yeah. But yeah, I, I need to check those out because I actually just clicked on yours last night um, mm -hmm. because I was like, okay, I need to act, like see it. Um, 
to come up with these things. Um, because I'll write these things down in, just into my notebook as I'm, you know, um, watching it um, or right after. Um, and I think I'll catch that later today, I think. Um, but everyone should check out shorts. I checked out, funnily enough, I haven't even checked out any documentaries yet. Uh -huh. um, I checked out the Naomi Osaka uh, episode one, and which is a Netflix documentary series um, directed by Garrett Bradley, who did Time last year. Mm -hmm. And then watched The Sound with Mark Ronson. I just got that done last night. Um, both good, good uh, docuseries, although I don't think the second one could qualify uh, necessarily mm -hmm. um, because it's more of a symposium on music and tech technology and how those two intersect. Sure. Um, and, but yeah, um, everyone should check out Shorts at a festival like this. It's great. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, I, most of my interviews are with short directors like yourself. Um, and the reason I book these is because they're, I, like I said in a past interview, I think I do in pretty much every interview. I think short interviews are the most interesting interviews to do um, because this is a 13 minute docu uh, documentary short. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's more packed into these two shorts than are packed into a movie um, oh, in, my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, everyone should check out at least shorts program two. I mean, I think all the shorts programs are free, but don't quote me on that. Um, uh, I just, going off what AFI Fest was like, I think all those were short programs were free. I don't know, actually. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, Lauren, I want to thank you so much uh, for agreeing to interview with me. Um, or I switch that around. It, it's early. Um, it's early. My pleasure. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And I really appreciate it. And I hope We'll check out your short as part of short program episode number two. Thank you so much. I yeah. really appreciate you having me. And yeah, I hope people do go check out short films. Often festivals are, you know, the only way that we get to see them. Whereas larger films will go on to, to you know, for bigger distribution possibilities. <laughs> so yeah, fests are, fests are the place to see shorts for sure. Yeah, and the interesting thing you brought up distribution is mm -hmm. this is a different kind of festival, I think. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think a lot of these shorts don't get as much attention, like you say, um, as the bigger films and don't and majorly don't get picked up because of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So everyone can look for my review of well, shorts program number two, I'll just do it as a big old thing because uh, yeah, uh, that's just easier. Um, uh, I think tomorrow, I think, or later today, I don't know yet. Nice.